So this is pretty exciting. I just now got in my inbox from Nick a preview video of what he's about to put out online in about an hour. And it uh, will be going over LDL and ApoB. And it's, in, it's a topic he and I have had some uh, spirited discussion on because it may be one of the few places where we have a slight nuanced difference. So I told him that I would go ahead and record this uh, both for uh, his pleasure and for yours. That's a true reaction in real time as it happens to watching this video. So let's take a look. Two things can be true at the same time, depending on how you look at them. In this video, I'm going to delve into some of the nuances of ApoB and all-cause mortality, focusing on two studies, an attempt to make the steel man case that ApoB is relevant to all-cause mortality, and even where it's not, it still might be more important than you think. Warning, this video is going to be provocative, but really it's just an appetizer for what's to come. A five hour long podcast between me and Simon Hill, the proof that after watching this video, I think you're going to be provoked to listen to. Yes, all five hours. Welcome to my channel. Stay curious. First, for a tiny bit of background, I want to distinguish ApoB from a related measure, LDL cholesterol. ApoB is a lipoprotein, and ApoB-containing lipoprotein particles are the family of lipoprotein particles that include LDL particles, and LDL cholesterol is the cholesterol content of LDL particles. And LDL particles constitute the most common ApoB-containing lipoprotein particles in the bloodstream. When it comes to cardiovascular risk assessment, there's now a trend towards focusing on ApoB as opposed to LDLC, since ApoB is a marker of LDL particle number, which is better than LDL cholesterol, which is cruder. By way of analogy, it's kind of like thinking about BMI, which is like LDL cholesterol versus body composition on DEXA scan. The body composition is more relevant to health. The BMI is cruder, but overall at a population scale, they tend to run the same. So LDLC and ApoB tend to run together at a population scale. Where they diverge a little bit, the ApoB is better. But for the sake of this video, you can consider them more or less the same if it's easier for you. Again, for the sake of this video, there is controversy, now getting back to our main point, over the relationship between ApoB, and by extension LDL, and all-cause mortality, or death by any cause. With some people noting a J-shaped relationship between ApoB and all-cause mortality, whereby very low levels of ApoB might not necessarily be better, because you see very low levels associate with higher all-cause mortality. But to appreciate whether this may or may not be a fair conclusion, we have to ask another question. What is the primary driver or primary predictor of all-cause mortality? And the answer is metabolic vulnerability. So the next question, what is metabolic vulnerability? Metabolic vulnerability is a marker of dysfunctional metabolism broadly, inclusive of malnutrition, inflammation, and malnutrition inflammation complex syndrome. Malnutrition and inflammation tend to synergize negatively in the body. And it's only very recently that we're starting to quantify metabolic vulnerability. And a really stellar paper that's central to our discussion was published by Ott Vossadol last year, 2023, in the Lancet Healthy Longevity. And it showed that metabolic vulnerability, a multi-marker, MVX, score, dominates as a predictor of all-cause mortality. Now, as an aside, the MVX score, the metabolic vulnerability score, was composed of glyc A, which is a systemic marker of inflammation, small HDL particle count, and citrate and three-branch chain amino acids, valine, isoleucine, and leucine. The specifics as why these six markers combined were such an effective multi-marker for metabolic vulnerability is beyond the scope of this discussion, but just take it as these markers combined constitute a pattern, a signature, of dysfunctional lipid metabolism. And strikingly, the MVX, metabolic vulnerability score, dominated beyond not just cholesterol for predicting all-cause mortality, five-year all-cause mortality, but factors like age. It was much stronger than even age at predicting all-cause mortality and was generalizable across different groups the young and the old, male and female, different races, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, metabolic vulnerability quantified by this MVX score is a powerful predictor of all-cause mortality, i.e. death. Now, why is this so important? Well, consider this. If I drop a pebble into a still lake, you'll see a ripple, right? Of course. But what if I drop the same pebble into white water or a raging stormy sea? 
Do you see the ripple? Well, of course not. It's lost in the raging stormy sea. This gets to the idea of a signal to noise ratio. If metabolic vulnerability is a really great predictor of all cause mortality, it's like the white water or the raging sea with respect to all cause mortality. And if you think of Apple B as the pebble, with respect to all cause mortality, dropping the pebble in the white water, you're not gonna see a signal. However, that does not mean that one, Apple B isn't important in mortality or can't be important in mortality, and two, that Apple B can't be important in other ways. Two points we'll hit on now. Focusing first on mortality in ApoB, I now want to turn to another paper published by Lee et al. in 2022, a year before the Ottvoss paper, characterizing the MVX score. We'll get to why that's relevant in a minute. And I want to jump straight to figures 5a and 5d and juxtapose them because you'll see there's a very interesting contrast. So focusing first on 5a, what they're looking at here in this is the unadjusted model whereby they're looking at the association between ApoB on the x-axis whereby more to the right is a higher ApoB and all cause mortality on the y-axis where higher is more death, higher all-cause mortality, and you see a J-shaped curve, right? Whereby at very low levels of ApoB, you see more mortality. And that might lead some to think, oh, lower ApoB is worse for all-cause mortality. But wait, what if you then account for what is a proxy for metabolic vulnerability? They actually didn't use the MVX score because again, it wasn't characterized for a year after this paper was published, but they adjusted for nutritional factors. And what you see when you do that is a transformation of the J curve into a line. You see a new relationship whereby lower ApoB continues to associate with lower all-cause mortality, lower death. And this is really important if you think about it, because if you think about an intervention that might change, let's imagine an intervention that just you know magically changes ApoB as a singular change in an individual, that individual's metabolic vulnerability is gonna be held constant. So the line, that secondary graph where you make the adjustment may be more important when considering therapy on an individual level. That really shines a new light on this, doesn't it? Another really important point I wanna make is that the predictors of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events are distinct. For example, the metabolic vulnerability score is really great at predicting fatal events, but not good at predicting non-fatal events. And of course, the non-fatal events are still very relevant to quality of life and health span. If you have a non-fatal stroke and end up impaired, is that relevant? You didn't die, but of course, it's still relevant. So just because a marker, say ApoB, isn't that strong at predicting all-cause mortality and there might be something stronger like metabolic vulnerability doesn't mean that the ApoB isn't important for other things, including predicting non-fatal events, which are still important to health, health span, and quality of life. So those are really the main points I wanted to make in this video. But for those who want to stick around the nuance ninjas, I wanna make a couple adjunctive points. Extra nuance. Okay, so I really do wanna stop here for a second and reflect on a, a few points that Nick is making. The metabolic vulnerability index is, I think, something that's very interesting, very exciting to look into, uh, obviously, were well acquainted to it because it's uh, um, something that um, Dr. William Cromwell is very interested in. I appeared with Dr. Cromwell in this recent episode with Simon in his podcast as well, if you've got the extra three and a half hours to spare. And the fact that it has a strong predictive um, value towards all-cause mortality it doesn't surprise me at all, particularly given its um, recognition of metabolic health, as I definitely think does not get the level of attention that it deserves. Now, where this gets interesting is, and in, it's part of why I had to interject when Nick was saying that ApoB may be better than LDL cholesterol within the context of uh, predicting all-cause mortality. I think that that's, that's a bit loaded, and here's the reason why. ApoB is the larger uh, category of ApoB-containing lipoproteins, which, as he said, and is true, is the vast majority of which are LDL, right? So ApoB-containing lipoproteins are in your bloodstream right now. The vast, vast majority are LDL. But importantly, the remainder of that are non-LDL, ApoB-containing lipoproteins, are remnants. So hear me when I say this next part because it's extremely important and relates back to metabolic health. If you look just at LDL, it's not that strong of a predictor. ApoB is a stronger predictor than LDL towards both uh, cardiovascular disease mortality and all-cause mortality. But if you subtract LDL from ApoB and look just at remnants, that has a much stronger association by far, particularly particle for particle, 
towards both all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. And the catch is that metab poor metabolic health tends to increase both, but particularly remnants. Remnants as a margin may not be as large as the pool of ApoB uh, LDL, but as ApoB VLDL, uh, as uh, chylomicrons, etc., they tend to be a slight bit higher, and that slight bit higher accounts for a much greater association with cardiovascular disease mortality. Now, the key thing that I've been chatting about that's been kind of a primary debate is why do they have that association, I believe, is extremely important. Is it because they independently drive cardiovascular disease, or is it the metabolic health, the, the poor metabolic health environment that results in a higher snapshot of what you observe with greater remnants as being more relevant in that association of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality? Well, obviously, all roads to me lead back to studying lean mass hyperresponders, this phenotype that's emerged that's central to our research, uh, for which you not only have a high level of LDL, you have a high level of ApoB, but you have a low number of remnants. And we've never really been able to get that combination together. And that's why it's important to make that distinction now, because something else that Nick gets into a little bit later before we get into this next section, is that those studies, like the one he was citing, when, when saying they've accounted for, what they're saying is through statistical instruments, they've sought to subtract the difference of the metabolic vulnerability or any number of other metabolic markers that may associate with cardiovascular disease such that they can feel confident that the association or, or causal, I should say, impact of ApoB is what's left over. And I think maybe the difference, the key difference between myself and Dr. Cromwell and perhaps myself and Nick Norwitz is that I don't have a lot of confidence that that's been well accounted for. I, I think that the statistical instruments that attempt to do this, things like sensitivity analyses, they're very interesting, and I think that they're great for hypothesis generating. I don't, I don't give them the level of confidence that you would have to um, feel sure of causality, even for the pebble that is the ripple. Now, when I say that, I emphasize, as I did on Simon's podcast, as I've done in my recent presentations, that's not me arguing for the opposite. That's just me saying it hasn't met the standard that I would tend to have that's very high for being able to make a claim of causality. And that's why we need to be able to study lean mass hyperresponders to better understand that. So that's my note. I want to get to the rest of Nick's video uh, here. Point one is that the physiological patterns we observe in things like the MVX score inform metabolism. It's not per se that, you know, the differences in branch chain amino acids, which are included in the MVX score, are themselves protective or harmful. But the composite, the fingerprint, the signature tells us something about the underlying metabolism. And that's really important. Since metabolic health is so important to overall health, what I think we really should be looking at is pattern. Things like the MVX score, but also the LMHR, lean mass hyperresponder triad, which constitutes the high LDL, the high HDL, and the low triglyceride pattern seen on some people who go low carb. And my interest in that, similar to the MVX score, is not that I think the high HDL is protective or the low triglycerides are protective, but the pattern together tells you something unique about the underlying physiology. Right. And that can be very interesting and informative to risk and outcomes. Yep. And we need to study that more. So point one, physiological patterns, signatures, inform us about metabolism and we need to look at things in context. Now, point two is that interventions come with side effects. It was nice in this video and it's a useful exercise to think about the abstraction of what if I just snap my fingers and lowered ApoB? What would that do to my risk? But in the real world, you have real patients with comorbidities, complex conditions, and interventions are required to have an effect on a biomarker. You can't really just snap your fingers and affect one biomarker. You can't snap your fingers and lower ApoB. You need to do something, a dietary intervention or take a medication. And in individual patient cases, these interventions can come 
come with side effects or harms or unknown long-term consequences because we don't have enough long-term data to understand them. So I think it's useful to make the steel man argument for ApoB lowering with respect to all-cause mortality, but also recognize humbly that there's a lot we don't know about the interventions required to exert ApoB lowering. And just consider that on an individual patient basis, there may be more complexities in determining what might be prudent for an individual with respect to care. And of course, that should be the realm of patient physician discussions and don't get health information or health advice off social media, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Let me just second that. As I've said a million times before, please uh, continue to work with your doctor. And I think that um, Nick's point is well taken and that any intervention uh, comes with potential trade-offs. Make sure that you get as educated as you can as to what those are and what they involve. Et cetera, et cetera. That should go without saying. Now, finally, to wrap up, I want to give a hat tip to two people. One is Simon Hill, The Proof. We actually just sat down for a five hour long podcast. That was a tremendous discussion. If you know a little bit more about me and Simon, you might think that we would be, quote, adversarial. But sitting down with him for five hours, man, I think this guy is going to be a lifelong friend. We got on great. And I think that there was so much nuance we unpacked in those five hours. I really, really hope that you listen to that episode. If you liked this video, you're going to like the nuance that we get into in that particular episode. So I'll link it below when it drops. And two, I want to give a hat tip to Professor William Cromwell, Bill Cromwell, who really turned me on to all the literature I just discussed with you and has really mentored me and taught me. And what I'm trying to do now is translate the lessons I've got from him to you. So hopefully I was able to do that to some extent, but I'd really like to credit Bill Cromwell for all I've learned on this topic. Um, Simon and Bill, hats off to you. You're both great gentlemen. And everyone, have a lovely day. So I'll second those hat tips. Um, both of them were fantastic. I loved uh, coming on with uh, each of them for that uh, recent podcast appearance. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll link it down below. And this video, just as a heads up, even though I'm recording it right before Nick is about to release it, I'm going to give it just a little bit of a delay before I put it out because I'd like for his video to uh, get a bit more headway first uh, before I actually put it on my own uh, YouTube channel. But I thought this was a great video. I thought, Nick, you did a, a, great, a good job of putting it together. It's interesting if there really is that uh, difference of opinion that we may have between each other, even on a small magnitude of effect uh, for ApoB as to whether we meet that level of confidence of independent causality for all-cause mortality or even for non-mortality-based events. Um, but it's not a bad thing, as always. It's, it's great. I mean... I, I joke about this all the time, but if you were to take uh, my and Nick's Venn diagram for our opinions, especially when it comes to lipids, they're like so overlapped, you have to like work hard to find the little margins where we might disagree. So uh, this has been a great video to review, and uh, I look forward to more. By the way, uh, one more pitch just to Nick himself. If you haven't yet, you should check out his channel. He's putting out videos like crazy, almost two a week, and he really puts a lot of great work into it. So if you haven't, um, uh, give him a like and a subscribe. Talk to you again soon.